if they change it all today, by the way, they're trying. Have you seen the new commercials? They are trying. They're trying. Uh, but can you recover from this? I mean, it's kind of going to stick with you, I think. These, these Bud Light drinkers, they, they don't like it. It's, it's going to be tough. I mean, they're only going to recover when they be clear about who they're trying to serve. It's by creating great products and services for your customer, being clear who your customer is. Football, it was about humor. It was about backyard barbecues. That's what it was about. And if this company would just come out and be explicit and say, you know what? We made a mistake. We got involved in politics. That's not what Bud Light does. We don't stand for getting involved in politics. We moved on from some of the marketing executives that made this bad choice. And moving forward, this brand will not get involved in advice and politics. That has to be the way forward. That has to be the step forward. So then all of a sudden their commercials can look authentic again. Yeah. Because right now they're trying to put out, you know, they just put out actually like a decent commercial, like yeah. country music fans, Zach mm -hmm. Brown songs. Like if they would have just done that a month ago, like they'd be in a much better position than 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 sponsoring somebody that stands for divisive politics. But like a, but I was just it's like it's so mind boggling to me. And I, I just look at it and some of the executives that were there uh, also have tremendous education backgrounds. Uh, it, you would think all that education, all that emphasis on marketing and yet not being able to do sort of the basic like go go down south and, and go to a bar and hang out with people that that drink your product. Right. Like, how could you be that divorced yeah, from it's a great who question. your customer is? And this hasn't really been covered that much, but. Six, seven years ago, around that same time frame I mentioned, like that 2016, 2017, Anheuser-Busch moved their entire sales and marketing organization out of St. Louis, Missouri, where it had been for well over 100 years. And I think you're more in, in kind of contact with that everyday Bud Light consumer. They moved it to New York City. And when they moved it to New York City, they hired people that tend to be from the East Coast. They hire firms that are in New York City. They headquarter themselves, you know, in Chelsea. And like everybody in that same area, there's a lot of group think about what it means to be diverse or what it means to be inclusive. And I think that that's a little bit divorced from what's really going on. And, you know, in the name of inclusivity, you don't necessarily want to alienate your existing customer base to try and bring in a new customer base. You have to build on your existing customers. Like that to me is more inclusive than actually excluding the people that made this brand uh, here, the here. largest beer brand in the U.S. Here, here, you know, in the news business, I've always said it's about leading, right? So you, you have a base and most often you and your base are sort of in sync on, on whatever it is that, that the thoughts that you're in sync on. But then, you know, sometimes as something comes along, you, you know, you want to be able to lead. You keep everybody there. Right. You can't just say, OK, well, you're the guy that, that brought me to the dance and now see ya, which is effectively what they just did at Bud Light. And I didn't realize that about where they moved their headquarters, because I know a lot of people from St. Louis and they are, you know, like it's authentic. It's like part of the flag. Right. They, they all drink Bud. They love Bud. They love uh, Bud Light. And, and now that's all changed. So the beneficiaries here happen to be Miller Light and Coors Light. I mean, it's amazing because they're like both up 13%. And if I add 13 and 13, <laughs> I'm it's looking at, you know, <laughs> yes. that's, so it. that's down. These are up. And, and, you know, it's interesting, like, you know, this, this, this beer business is different than other companies that have gotten into politics, like Disney, for example. When Disney got into politics, like there's only one Disney world. You don't really have other opportunities really where to go. Or there's you know very few other studios that create movies for kids. But in this beer industry, it's very easy for consumers to switch. Because at every single bar you go to, you have Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light. At every single convenience store, at every grocery store, you have those exact same options. And these are purchases that consumers make on a weekly basis. It's not like a once a year trip you go to to Disney World. Or you know, a lot of people, they'll say, like, I don't like Nike, but you buy shoes once a year. So maybe you've, you've forgotten about some controversy. This is something that is in your, your um, view every single week when you're out at restaurants, you're out at grocery stores. And it's just an easy decision to make because the pricing is the same. A lot of the products are actually very similar. Same. It's water, barley, hops. And then it's a little bit of just like the marketing, which differentiates these companies. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's just easy to make a switch. And unfortunately, until again, Anheuser-Busch makes it clear about who their customer is going to be and who they're marketing to, they don't have a distinct brand or a distinct voice relative to Miller like Coors Light. And those companies right now are the beneficiaries. Hey, so I'm looking at the stock price right now. And it's a challenge today as we go to air right now, down one and some change, almost one and a half percent. Call it $63.76. If I look back to where it was on April 2nd, before this war, just as this whole scandal uh, hit the news, it was up at 66.57. So you're talking a few billion dollars worth of market cap. It's still suffering from. Uh, would you have thought it might have been down more? What do you think in terms of the stock price itself being able to recover? 
Yeah, I in, in my own view, I probably would have thought it would have been down more uh, when you have your largest brand in the United States being down 26 percent. And then you have a lot of the other brands they own as well, like Michelob Ultra and Bush Light, which were growing in the, in the high single to uh, to low double digits, also being down over the last week. I would have thought that would it would have been hit more. Um, I don't know if there's uh, some some insider folks that are buying the stock. I don't know. Maybe it's become a meme stock. I don't know where people are buying it, but it seems like there's a little bit of the fundamentals that, uh, that are divorced from reality. But I think like, even the bigger story, though, I mean, take sort of like the short term noise. There's a lot of short term noise that can be in there. But go back to even like 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. when the stock was peaking and it had that shareholder capitalism mindset but that really switched in 2018, where they adopted stakeholder capitalism and ESG at the behest of the BlackRock, State Street's vanguards. And if you take a look since that time period, the stock is actually down from the 2017, 2018 highs by 20, 30%. Whereas the consumer index, if you just like look at all the other consumer index stocks, uh, they're up about 80%. So there's almost like a hundred percent difference in terms of the performance over the last five years of Anheuser-Busch versus consumer staples. And that's probably the bigger story just to take a look For at sure. from a stock. For sure. No, I mean, and I think that, you know, other companies as they make these mistakes, right? Investors are losing out ultimately, because if you're the pension fund that puts your money with BlackRock and BlackRock is more concerned about whether or not we have enough, you know, Tom, Dick's, Harry's, Jane, Susan's, Jill's, and, you know, many, many different colors, whatever it is on the board of a company, as opposed to say, is this company making money? I mean, by the way, I would argue diversity is actually the strength of a company that helps it make money because you have more viewpoints and therefore more thoughts about how to, you know, you don't ever want the group think like maybe you had at AB InBev there in uh, Chelsea. But, you know, it's like they're focused on that as opposed to the results, and the results are the profits, which I would think would drive a stock price higher. I mean, this is a much bigger theme for the country overall and one I know you guys are really, really concerned about. No, Trish, you're exactly right. That's what, that's what we're trying to fix at Strive. And that's why we're doing things a little bit differently at Strive, that we're trying to bring companies back to focusing on shareholders and shareholder primacy. Because the stakeholder capitalism model, which is actually upstream of ESG, that BlackRock, States, and Vanguard are pushing, you know, this isn't new. This has been around in Europe for the last 40 years. Where Europe has adopted stakeholder capitalism. That's, That's not a good sign, economy. by the way. It's not a good sign. <laughs> you know, we we don't want to be Europe. Europe. <laughs> no, because if you look at the broad-based returns, European broad-based returns trail the US by two to 300 basis points per year. And that's like thousands of basis points of compound returns they've lost out on in Europe over the last few years. And it's not like Europe's a better society. You know, it's not like there's this trade-off of returns and they have this halcyon society where they're leading in innovation or technology or young people have access to jobs. It's the opposite. So this is a model that it's frankly, it's bad for capitalism, but it's also bad for democracy as well. Like, let's go back to letting our companies focus on what they do best, focusing on driving great products, services, innovation. And then let's let our democracy work where individuals have a vote and a voice in terms of these divisive political issues, not having companies get involved in them and trying to solve these issues better left off to, uh, to politicians. So that's what we're trying to get started. Yes, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing you're doing it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anson. Great to see you. We'll talk soon.